for a cataract surgeon webinar. Uh, wanted to first congratulate uh, all my uh, colleagues here for an absolutely stunning star cast. Thank you, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Lahane to get this absolute star cast uh, for a beautiful webinar that we have for you guys for the next one hour. Uh, without wasting any more time, and I know everybody wants to hear you guys speak, without wasting any more time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lahane and Dr. Namrata uh, to tee off this webinar, Glaucoma Practice for a Cataract Surgeon. Thank you. Can, can you uh, hear me now? Namrata, can you hear now? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, welcome, ev welcome everyone to this uh, uh, unique uh, webinar today, which is Glaucoma Practice for a Cataract Surgeon. And uh, with me, I have uh, my co-moderator, Dr. T.P. Lane, sir. Uh, Dr. T.P. Lane uh, does not need any introduction. He's so well-renowned uh, in the field of cataract surgery. He has a record of uh, doing uh, one of the largest number of cataract surgery. Uh, he's a Padmashree awardee. And uh, currently, he's, he's the director of the Directorate of uh, Medical Education and Research, um, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Health uh, at uh, Maharashtra, uh, in the state of Maharashtra, uh, in Mumbai. Uh, apart from this, we have a galaxy of uh, speakers, and uh, which includes Dr. Murli Ariga, Dr. Douglas Ree, Dr. Gaurav Dutra, Dr. S.S. Pandav, Dr. Priya Narang, and Dr. Ronnie George and uh, uh, these are the talks uh, that we have and i think without much ado uh, we would uh, begin the program but before that i would request dr tp lane uh, who, to say a few words uh, thank you namrata i think uh, everybody knows dr namrata sarma she is a professor and head in the uh, aims and uh, uh, she is a secretary of the aios uh, another thing is she is an excellent cornea surgeon and uh, I think the she is the uh, person who knows each and every person in India. I think she is very down to her. Uh, secondly, she helps each and every person and uh, her knowledge, I think I salute her knowledge. Whenever I see her videos, I always feel I should, I should also be able to do such type of things. Secondly, today our topic, I think I am not uh, wasting your more time, but the cataract and glaucoma. I think that is concerned with me. And whenever there is a cataract patient comes to me, if it is a lens induced or something uh, cataract induced glaucoma, in that cases, I always feel okay, I can operate. But there are so many cases where I am having a dilemma that I what I should do. Today also there was one eyed patient I saw and then I thought in the evening we can discuss. So at the end we will definitely discuss, but we will go ahead. Namrata, you can call the first speaker. So it is my pleasure and honor to call the first speaker, a very good friend, uh, Dr. Murli Arega, who did his uh, post-graduation from Shankar Netrale and MJ Western Regional Institute, Ahmedabad, did his fellowships from Shailai Hospital, CMZ Pelor and New, New York Eye Year Infirmary, New York. And he's very well known in glaucoma circles, has done a huge amount of work in glaucoma in India. Yeah. And uh, I, he would be talking about uh, cataract with glaucoma decision making in double trouble. Thank you, Dr. Namrata. And uh, I sincere thanks to the AOS and, of course, uh, the uh, Agarwal team uh, led by Dr. Ashwin for enthusiastically organizing this program. And I also my thanks to Dr. Lahane for the uh, nice introduction. I'm going to speak about uh, the double trouble which you all encounter quite commonly, this cataract with glaucoma. Uh, cataract with glaucoma is relatively common in the elderly and often miss is the glaucoma. We are very often we look at the cataract and forget the glaucoma or miss the glaucoma. So let's look at the surgical options of when you have glaucoma with cataract. So we can do just the cataract alone, that's the IOL alone, and uh, give gla glaucoma medication and plan the surgery later if it becomes needed, the glaucoma surgery. Or you can look at glaucoma surgery first if glaucoma is a priority and look at IOL surgery later. There's only one single surgery. And of course, you can also look at a combined glaucoma and cataract surgery. So what are the factors that influence us to go ahead with what we are going to say now? Is the patient's response to the glaucoma medication, the extent of the glaucoma, the severity of the optic nerve damage and the visual field loss, 
the surgeon's experience and training in phaco trab and different types of surgery which we're going to discuss the cost economics of treatment and where the patient comes from and how far he lives from your practice and so on i think it is definitely the bottom line is that you should involve the patient as a partner in your management and discuss all of these you need to do a thorough assessment look at a comprehensive eye exam it's not just intraocular pressure and gonioscopy we have to look at the anterior chamber depth the corneal endothelium the pupil and the, how it dilates well the zonule support weak zonules high myop anterior chamber being a hyper hyperopic kind of eye and of course you have to do a perimetry where possible to assess the severity of the glaucoma an optic disc examination and an oct rnf imaging when possible and the media allows you to do all of these so get a thorough examination done before you embark on the kind of procedure which you are planning and that is an example of a cataract with glaucoma in which you see the cataract component can be seen in the total deviation and the glaucoma component can be seen in the pattern deviation this is a patient whom i saw yesterday with advanced primary angle closure glaucoma with cataract and some glaucoma so here the decision comes as to with how much is cataract how much is glaucoma the underlying glaucoma is very clearly obvious in the pattern deviation so getting a threshold perimetry is quite useful in these patients so let's look at cataract surgery alone which most of us as ophthalmologists would be familiar with when the uh, glaucoma damage is mild and when you know that you can reach your target pressure with one or two well tolerated medications you can prefer to do pico iol or sic iol and expect that the iop lowering will be about 4 mm less and it's not suitable for the low, lower target iops in the advanced glaucoma so this is about cataract alone and the phaco is a wonderful uh, technique of cataract surgery in which you can do clear cornea surgery you don't touch the conjunctiva you can do uh, surgery well away from a bleb if there's an existing bleb you can also permit surgery phaco kind of surgery under a trabeculectomy kind of a scleral flap when you're doing a same size surgery so phaco has been a great boon to the glaucoma surgeon IOL surgery has advantages very quick no special training required permits accurate field tests and optic nerve examination subsequently so most of us would like to do an IOL alone given a choice so how does the iop get lowered by just doing the cataract alone if you look at the pre op in angle closure as well as in open angle the angle definitely opens up and it opens up more in angle closure than in the open angle obviously and substantially increases the angle width the iop also drops with angle closure open angle pseudo exfoliation and normal tension glaucoma And the reason could be the flushing of the trabecular meshwork, the interleukins, the use to the ultrasound. There's so many hypotheses, but the IOP does get lower after phaco surgery. So the lens is actually important, and the role of the lens in angle closure disease is a big uh, discussion and debate going on. To look at this example of a very very shallow AC in both eyes, complete angle closure with sinicae, the discs and the IOP being on the borderline high, the lens nearly clear. So where does the lens here actually become the culprit? to look at this example from the ios guidelines published by a group uh, led by dr anuj dada to look at the lens vault is actually becoming an important component in the same i the same patient of the right eye and the left eye the lens vault is very high in one eye and the lens vault is less in the other eye so the lens becomes a culprit in many patients with angle closure disease you should seriously think of removing the lens when you think that the lens is the cause a lens based procedures can be uh, considered in angle closure disease as clear lens extraction which is highly debatable phaco alone when there is a cataract phaco with gonio sinicae lysis has been tried by many of us and phaco with trabeculectomy which has been the standard of care so far so we encounter many problems and difficulties when you have cataract surgery in glaucomatous eyes small rigid pupils you need to deal with that shallow acs low endothelial cell counts floppy iris weak zonules plan for a larger rexus use stripe and blue if you can't see the anterior capsule well a good hydro dissection keep ctrs and segments ready and when you have small eyes like anophthalmic eyes and myopic eyes you need to be wary and you need to prepare for all of these post operatively you can have cmes and iop spikes you must watch for inflammation if you're doing combined surgeries particularly avoid post prostaglandins watch for the steroid induced iop rise and needless to say the bottom line as i have put it in the slide a glaucoma surgeon has to be proficient in phaco in such difficult situations So when would you consider glaucoma surgery alone when you have cataract with glaucoma when you have an advanced near total glaucomatous copping like this you have uncontrolled severe glaucoma with maximal treatment a very minimal cataract the priority here becomes glaucoma to do the glaucoma surgery alone and hope for the best the disadvantage being that the vision will remain unchanged there will be two procedures if you're doing a cataract subsequently and you can definitely expect that the cataract is going to form and progress in the next 5 years 
So what are the problems and difficulties when you're doing a cataract surgery after the glaucoma surgery is done? You have a bleb like this. So you have to have to, uh, you need to avoid damage to the bleb, take extra care while inserting the speculum, coat the bleb with visco, avoid the incisions at the bleb site, observe the principles of closed chamber phaco techniques, use the appropriate viscoelastic to protect the cornea, and use low fluidic parameters and suture the incision whenever you have a doubt. These are the tips I would probably give you when you're planning to do phaco and eyes with blebs like this. So when is combined surgery uh, thought about? When you have cataract with uncontrolled IOP, a moderate cataract and a visually disabling cataract, medication cannot be tolerated or simply patient does not want to use more than two or three medication. So we know that the IOP lowering is better than the cataract surgery alone. We know that the visual improvement will be better than the TRAB alone. We know that the IOP spikes can be avoided in the immediate post-operative period. And there's a lower cost and morbidity of doing a single procedure. But you must know that there can be a little more time for the surgery needed. And of course, the inflammation, the fibrin reaction and so on, that has to be handled when you do a combined surgery. So combined surgery has evolved over time from various relatively primitive kind of procedures which we now look at to procedures like phaco trab and phaco with ECP, phaco with the micropulse PACPC, which I've just started doing, and phaco with MIGS, I think, which Dr. V is going to talk about. Phaco can be combined with glaucoma drainage devices and so on. So a lot of procedures are available to us. And a lot of literature, if you let search the literature, overwhelming the amount of data that's available. To put it in a nutshell, I would say that the separate site phaco trab would probably lower the intraocular pressure more than a same site surgery. And probably the use of mitomycin or ologen would probably give you better IOP control than not using this in a combined surgery. So this is some of the uh, recent procedures which I've started doing in angle closure glaucomas. I would probably do a micropulse diet CPC when I don't want to do a trap, advanced PSCG, wait for a while and then plan the cataract operation. These are the settings which I do for the micropulse diet. It's exciting technology. Still early days, but we still have time to evaluate all of these. I'm going to show you a short video clip of how the uh, combined surgery is done at the same site. It's one of my older videos, which shows you a little relatively larger incision. You do the FACO in the usual way. Do the IA as I do with the bimanual or with the uh, single coaxial IA. After the IA, you implant the lens. And after the lens is implanted, it is, this is applicable to the uh, surgeons who do the SICS as well. You can actually open up the flap like this or you don't even need to open the flap, you can do it under the flap as well. What I usually do is I like to leave the internal cataract incision alone, and I probably go in a little behind and do the trabecterectomy slightly behind the uh, cataract incision, so that that gives me a separate uh, trabecterectomy uh, opening for the uh, filtration. This is the uh, standard Kelly sponge, which I use for the uh, glaucoma surgery, and uh, multiple punches to ensure that you have good adequate uh, filtration. And iridectomy is very useful here, definitely useful, particularly in angle closure glaucomas. And all the tribes I generally do an iridectomy like this, flush out the uh, posterior pigment of the cut iridectomy, and I apply a suture on the flap after the flaps are sutured. In this particular case, I have used ologen as well. So this is the other video which I would like to show you. And uh, this is a combined surgery in, in which I do a separate site, of course, but you need not switch uh, from temporal to superior and so on. What I would do is I'd make a little flap to the left of my myself as I'm operating. And I do the FACO leaving the uh, scleral flap in place, complete the FACO. And uh, once the FACO is complete, this is a relatively harder cataract and angle closure glaucoma. You can see the PI in this uh, place here, the PI is patent. Avoid doing the uh, incision on, on right on the PI. After the FACO is completed, the usual way, and uh, you can go in and uh, do the complete the trabeclectomy. What I would like to show you here in this particular video is the uh, separate site, but sitting in one, uh, maybe I, I usually sit superiorly, so I can do both in the same. To the left, I do the trap, to the right, I do the uh, FACO. And the okay, trap is now completed using the uh, uh, side port knife as well as the uh, punch. The video is edited, that's why it looks quicker. I don't do operate that this fast. So once the iridectomy is done, I, have, I put in a releasable suture. The important thing is to titrate the pressure using the releasables like this. For all of you who do the trabeclectomy, I'm sure all of you are familiar. My technique has been to use one single apex releasable suture. This has been my technique for the last so many years. And uh, this is the apex releasable, which I do. I have used mitomycin in this uh, case.
and my simple algorithm for dealing with cataract and glaucoma of course we are going to discuss in the panel as well for the mild glaucoma with good iop control and the patient can tolerate the medication i would probably do iol surgery alone consider feco or maybe sics depending on the surgeon skill if you have medication problems even with mild glaucoma i would probably come think of combined surgery but i would probably do a same site feco trab or a combined surgery in which i would probably reserve another site for a subsequent trab again or retrab or a tube if necessary for moderate to severe glaucomas i would probably think of combined surgery and i would definitely use uh, anti metabolites or ologen i now and nowadays i use 0.2 mmc uh, in place of 0.4 and for a minute or two depending on the uh, severity and the need for the uh, anti metabolites thank you all for your attention thank you so much uh, dr murli for that very crisp and uh, very precise talk and i think uh, because uh, dr uh, re has to uh, leave after some time we'll take his talk and then after that we'll take the questions so for both the talks we can have the questions together it is my uh, privilege to uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, our esteemed guest uh, uh, dr re Uh, who joined University Hospital Science Institute in 2013 and serves as the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Uh, he is a renowned glaucoma specialist, molecular biologist, and board certified ophthalmologist. He completed his residency at Wills Eye Hospital and uh, was awarded a competitive Heat Fellow Award and completed clinical glaucoma fellowship uh, from Baskin Palmer Eye Institute and a postdoc uh, lab fellowship. at the national eye institute of national institute of health bethesda uh, investigating the molecular biology of intraocular pressure regulation he has a uh, uh, keen interest in both adult and childhood glaucomas and also in complex and high risk cases as well as rare clinical syndromes and the more common forms of uh, glaucoma and his um, research papers also speak of the same he has introduced the surgical procedure ab interno trabeculectomy in 2006 and also i stent a micro stent that enhances aqueous humor uh, drainage to the to lower the intraocular pressure he is the leading educator for all of thermologist and has served uh, for the scientific and curriculum uh, committees for the american academy of ophthalmology national institute of health american glaucoma society american society of cataract and refractive surgeons and american board of uh, ophthalmology he contributed to ao where he was recognized by the achievement award Uh, uh in 2013 as well as the senior achievement award which he is also received and he's also organized uh, and developed the curricula for numerous regional and national meetings for continuing education of his colleague of thermologists uh he was named the chair of glaucoma curriculum uh, committee for the uh, ASCRS uh, which looks at the glaucoma content of the AS ASCRS activities he has uh, been an invited speaker to several of the meetings regionally nationally and internationally he is also a great writer he has authored uh, co-authored the wills eye drug guide and was the lead editor for the third editions of wills eye uh, manual as well as authored the ophthalmic drug guide and uh, the color atlas and synopsis of clinical uh, ophthalmology glaucoma and he has also served as a co-editor of the shields textbook of glaucoma which all the fellows and the residents they read uh, when they are in their fellowship uh, additionally he has contributed to chapters uh, which are several in number in various textbooks and he also has a interest in patient advocacy and education and so he served to advocate for patient safety issues at the legislative uh, level something that uh, many of us will not know and uh, he is the president vice president of the mass uh, society of eye physicians and surgeons Uh, from 2009 to 2013 uh, and have uh, testified before the Massachusetts House of Representatives as well so welcome uh, dr uh, douglas re and uh, over to uh, dr uh, re for his uh, talk he is going to be talking to us thank you very much uh, it is such an honor and a pleasure to share uh the stage with with uh, so many internationally renowned speakers uh this evening so thank you very much it's a pleasure uh so I'll be speaking about the Hydrus implant one of the newer uh MIGS devices uh these are my disclosures and uh, the one to Ivantis is uh relevant um 
The hydrus is one of the trabecular meshwork bypass procedures, so it fits in the same category as the trabectome, the KDB blade, the eye stent, the eye stent inject, uh, as well as GAT. So what is the hydrus implant? Uh, the hydrus implant is made out of nitinol, which is the same material used for cardiac bypass stents. Um, it's a stent and a shunt that's inserted through the trabecular meshwork and threaded partially through Schlem's canal to dilate it. The device has three fenestrations to allow uh, aqueous to drain through the collecting channels, and it covers approximately three clock hours. Uh, it's indicated for mild to moderate open angle glaucomas in combination with cataract surgery, but it can, use, it can be used off-label uh, as a standalone procedure, and we'll look at some of that data in just another minute or so. This is a surgical procedure, so it's a curved insertion device, and you make an incision with the, the sharp point uh, in the trabecular meshwork and then thread uh, the hydrus implant uh, into Schlem's canal. Uh, then it detaches, and you can go ahead and slide it in. And this is unedited. Well, okay, maybe that part's edited. <laughs> just to just to hook that edge, uh, and and sort of push it the rest of the way in, so that a small portion of it is outside the canal um, and allows fluid to drain through that. And that's what a, a properly placed uh, stent looks like. With regard to the surgical uh, procedure, a few tips. Uh, you want to approach the angle at about a 15 degree angle. Uh, you want to angle the, the, uh, the bevel of the inserter slightly upwards, especially when starting to feed into the canal so it doesn't accidentally go into the ciliary body. And you want to make sure you can visualize it progressing through the canal the entire way. If you lose track of it, that means it's tracking somewhere that it shouldn't. You can simply regrasp and pull it back and attempt it again. So let's go over some of the data. Um, this is the basic science data. Uh, this is from uh, the labs of Carol Torres, uh, and she showed that when you use the eight millimeter hydrus device, which is what is commercially available, uh, it in, in fact uh, dilates Schlem's canal. Uh, and, and it increases the amount of drainage. So these two manuscripts very elegantly demonstrate that. Uh, clinically, the uh, prospective randomized controlled trial, the Horizon study, which compares cataract plus the hydrus implant compared to cataract alone, is out to three years of follow-up. And this is truly hot off the presses. Uh, our group just published the three-year data uh, in 2020, uh, just this last month. Uh, and so it's 369 eyes, and at 36 months, uh, the, there's similarity uh, between the two groups with regard to intraocular pressure, but a statistically significant difference uh, in the number of medications required uh, to achieve that pressure. So that demonstrates uh, as an outcome measure that the hydrus implant is additive to cataract surgery alone. This is what the, the IOP and medication data look like graphically from the manuscript. And <clears throat> this is published in, in ophthalmology again. Um, so if you see that it came down from a mean pressure of approximately 25 uh, and the pressure is hovering at around 17, uh, mean number of medications required is about a little less than half uh, with the hydrus implant in place and uh, close to one uh, with the, without the hydrus. In terms of survival, the probability of needing secondary glaucoma procedures is a lot less uh, if you have uh, the hydrus implant compared to cataract surgery alone. As far as safety, uh, the only thing that, that showed up which would make sense uh, in terms of safety is uh, focal peripheral anterior synechiae or PAS uh, right by the hydrus implant, uh, but in general, most of these are non-occlusive. All the other uh, safety uh, aspects are, are the same between uh, cataract alone and cataract with hydrus. Um, and so at three years, what the data that I showed in this slide is from two years. Uh, the three-year manuscript, we didn't put in the same table. There really is no difference, just a slightly higher proportion of PAS, um, and most of it was uh, uh, non-occlusive. There's essentially no significant difference with regard to safety. Well, we do worry about endothelial cell density in this day and age, and at three years, this is three-year data, 
um, there really is no difference between cataract alone and hydrus. So uh, it is effective at blunting IOP spikes and post day the op day one, this is Henry Jampel's uh, group looking uh, at a post hoc analysis of the Horizon uh, study. Uh, and this is just two year data looking at the washout uh, and showing that, in fact, uh, when you wash out the, the medications, the hydrous implant is, is quite effective at increasing uh, the outflow and, as a subsequent consequence, decreasing the intraocular pressure. What about comparative data comparing the hydrus versus other devices? Uh, so in the laboratory, uh, the hydrus had a greater reduction of outflow facility, so an improvement uh, compared to two eye stents. Uh, that was Dr. Torres's lab. And then Dr. Torres and I uh, worked together uh, when she was at Case Western, and uh, we compared the hydrus as well against two eye stent device and two eye stent injects. And the hydrus was again superior to eye stent, to regular eye stents, but and the eye stent inject. But what was interesting is that the regular eye stent did better than the two eye stent injects. So that was an interesting finding that we think is related to the lumen size, um, but we're not exactly sure why that was the case. The only prospective randomized controlled trial comparing two different standalone MIGS procedures, and this is not in combination with cataract surgery, is the COMPARE study. Uh, the COMPARE study looked at uh, two eye stents versus a hydrus device. Um, and so far, we have published uh, this year up to 12 months, the two-year data we are assembling now. But essentially, you see a reduction in intraocular pressure with both eyes, uh, but you see a, a more reduction of medications with a hydrus implant indicating its superiority uh, in, and its ability to lower intraocular pressure. So, and this difference is significant at all time points. So in conclusion, the hydrus is effective at improving IOP control as demonstrated by decreasing the number of medications needed to control intraocular pressure when added to cataract surgery. The hydrus is more effective than two eye stents demonstrated both clinically and in the laboratory. The hydrus is more effective than two eye stents uh, as demonstrated in, in the laboratory. Uh, to eye stent injects rather in the laboratory and to date the hydrus has an excellent safety profile that is common with tm bypass uh, imp implants thank you very much for the invitation to address you this evening thank you so much dr reed the hydrus looks very exciting i think we'll take the questions uh, sir uh, dr tp lane sir you can take the questions now if there are uh, questions definitely uh, uh, the uh, question to re that whenever now we are implanting the this uh, address i have seen that is a very interesting but uh, now the to go into the slim canal you are using the prism so you tell me what are the landmarks how we can uh, recognize and identify this slim uh, uh, canal to implant this uh, address implant Dr. Lahani, you are absolutely uh, correct in, in, in pointing out the, the most important question. Um, <clears throat> the, the most important landmark is to identify scleral spur, uh, but that can sometimes be very tricky. And it's easy to get fooled by a, a pigment line yes. um, or yes. pigmentation. And, and the most important thing is not to create a psychodialysis cleft. So what I often caution is that if you're unsure, always go more anterior. And if you make a mistake, all you've done is scratch uh, the, uh, the peripheral corneal endothelium, which is not going to have any visual outcome or any significant long-term effect. It is much better to, to, um, to do that rather than to be too posterior and create a cyclodialysis cleft. However, with the hydrus device, if you, since it only requires an incision uh, to, uh, through the trabecular meshwork, if you end up advancing it into uh, the, the ciliary body, uh, it doesn't have the same level of damage uh, that you would with either a, a misplaced eye stent or if, uh, uh, goodness gracious, if we're doing a goniotomy um, and, you know, it put the blade or, or the trabectome device in the wrong spot. So it really is, uh, you just withdraw it and, and the patient doesn't suffer hypotony uh, from that. But Dr. Lahani, that, that's the most critical question is identifying the landmarks. Uh, you are correct. I think, thank you very much. Second question is that whenever you are, uh, what is the length of the implant? 
Uh, the length of the implant is eight millimeters, uh, which spans approximately three clock hours. Okay. Now, how we will know that the implant is not uh, inside the canal? It is. Uh, it has gone outside the canal. Why uh, the implant? Yeah, it, it is, uh, fortunately, uh, when you uh, put the, the, whatever you use, I just use the inserter itself. You can also use any kind of Sinsky hook uh, to further drive it in. It's almost impossible to push it all the way in. Uh, but even if you do, it slides back out very easily. So, in, in fact, you want to be very careful about that. Otherwise, it'll slide all the way out. Um, fortunately, that hasn't yet happened to me. I'm sure that it will at some point. But the inserter is very well designed so that you can re-grasp the end, pull it back into the device, and, and just do the procedure again. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much for uh, telling us everything about this. And we are really excited to, I think, implant this uh, device, new device in the glaucoma. I've got another question to the Murli. Only my question to you, you is that whenever you saw that, uh, you uh, showed us the table where you are writing that when the mild uh, this uh, glaucoma is there, you should go for the uh, different uh, drab and only the glaucoma. And when it is a uh, moderate or it's the severe, then you should do the combined surgery. Now, how you are deciding the uh, moderate and severe? What what classification you are using for this moderate and severity? Is it uh, only the tension, or is it angle, or is it, uh, uh, it is, is it, is it uh, optic nerve? As far as possible, yes, thank you, sir. As far as possible, I think the severity of glaucoma is decided based on perimetry, at least in my practice. So wherever possible, when you're getting a visual field done, depending on the extent of the field loss, you can say depending on the number of points, arcuate or double arcuate, and close to fixation, that is when you really decide the extent of functional damage and severity of glaucoma. You can, of course, judge by looking at the optic nerve when a field is not possible. And you can also judge by looking at the RNFL when you have an OCT image and so on. And of course, the level of the intraocular pressure also can give you an estimate as to how high the pressure is and so on. And uh, basically, the optic nerve and the visual field gives us a good clue as to the severity of glaucoma. We have various methods to judge as mild, moderate and severe based on perimetry. So depending on the extent of field loss, we can judge the field as mild, moderate, and severe. This is one simple method of estimating the severity. Amurli, you are correct, but I ask very uh, peculiar, the particular question that it is a cataract. And when there is a cataract, in the, uh, the field changes are there because of cataract also. So when yes. you are getting the field changes of the cataract and field changes of the glaucoma, then we may have the confusion that these field, field changes are it is because of the glaucoma and we may classify this as uh, you can say the moderate or severe so in such Correct, situation sir. what clue you will give it to me that okay field there are some changes added changes by the lens so what i should uh, look for it's a very good question so that is the uh, gen generally a cataract would cause a generalized depression of the visual field on the md you can actually make it out on the uh, main deviation when you're able to do a perimetry for this patient. If you have a total cataract, the question does not arise. When you have a cataract which you can do a visual field, the MD will give you a clue as to the extent of the diffuse loss due to the cataract. The pattern deviation, I, I think I did mention in one of my slides, that the pattern deviation would actually show you the extent of the glaucoma that underlies the cataract when you have cataract to glaucoma. So pattern deviation and the total deviation, you can have a judgment of the rough idea of what the cataract is all about. And of course, needless to say, some glaucomas can have diffuse loss as well. So, but in general, you can say the mean deviation and the generalized loss is an, is an indicator of how much cataract and uh, the pattern deviation would give you how much of glaucoma underlies the cataract and glaucoma. Thank you. Uh, any, any question, uh, Nam Namrata? Well, I think, uh, sir, uh, we've uh, had two great talks in the beginning. And thank you very much, Dr. Ree, for sparing your time and being with us. Uh, and thank you for that great talk. Uh, I'm sure other panelists have not had, I don't know whether Hydrus is available in India or not. I'm sure it, if it is not, then it will be very soon uh, for others to try it out. Thank you, Dr. Ree. Thank uh, you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So the next talk is going to be by Dr. Gaurav Dutra. And uh, Dr. Gaurav Dutra, again, does not need any introduction. He's an internationally renowned eye surgeon, uh, both in the field of cataract and refractive surgery and uh, also the chairman ARC of Intraocular Implant and Refractive Surgery Society of India. 
and uh, he's a, a good friend of mine and i know him since his post graduate days so he's going to be talking about uh, the sponsors uh, product that is uh, the aba the my experience with the advanced uh, vision analyzer or ava thanks a lot dr namrata and a very good evening to everyone um, i was uh, asked by ashwin to share my views uh, with the lsr and with the ava so <clears throat> at the outset uh, you know when when we got the invitation to test out the advanced visual analyzer um, i've been watching it grow for the last 2 uh, 3 years and how it's come of age and uh, you know uh, following it with lot of interest but we've all grown up uh, with you know looking at uh, humphries fields or the uh, you know the uh, octopus and uh, you know we rarely want to look at anything else and we are so used to interpreting it we are in a comfort zone and uh, frankly uh, you know i have grown the same way so you always look at uh, new technologies with a little bit of uh, you know you, you think that whether this will be able to come up to what uh, we are already used to and you are always uh, suspicious and uh, you know especially when it comes to glaucoma fields one is always thinking that you know we have these normative databases and everything is standardized it works so well in my hands i don't even want to try out anything new so those were the thoughts which you know initially come and then you know it looks so interesting and i'm always interested in new technology i said i must test this out so when ashwin said i decided that you know we will uh, immediately do this and frankly it was a very very pleasant surprise and uh, so this is basically a uh, you know a advanced vision analyzer is what they call it it's a battery operated small portable device which is basically an automated perimeter and it can do uh, threshold uh, visual field measurements and i think priya is going to talk in detail but i'll just give you the small little experiences that we had it can be used anywhere in a traditional exam lane it can be carried to a camp and uh, you, essentially you know the co capital cost investment is very little and uh, you know you can uh, actually go ahead uh, in uh, any place you could be sitting on a sofa you could be sitting any comfortable place and you can do this test with this small device which is put on to your uh, head and uh, you know it's like a virtual uh, uh, you know uh, this thing a uh, headset for virtual gaming and the other things that have come into a work now and it comes with a small tab so this is how it looks it's very patient friendly patient can be you know uh, essentially we've all seen that on the humphries which we use uh, patient positioning is so important and there are there these elderly patients who have a back issue they cannot sit comfortably so you end up sometimes avoiding doing a field test for them and you rely upon the oct and you are not really happy about it now this tends to solve everything it's quite patient friendly and they can sit almost anywhere they could be looking you know the chin position and everything doesn't have to be very much fixed like it could be with a virtual with a normal perimeter and you know you can just put the headset and they could be actually looking anywhere and they will be able to uh, do the field test very nicely so this is one thing which really stood out we did these trials we've been doing a comparative study between the humphries and the uh, ava and we've been seeing uh, how it compares to that uh, we have done quite a few patients now and uh, it's fairly simple to use so our staff found it very easy to use in fact those who are not doing uh, you know who are not being allowed to do humphries fields were very easily able to do the thing on the tab because it's quite intuitive and uh, it becomes uh, very easy for some of our clinical assistants to use it they learn it very fast and for the patients also it's fairly easy to use it is a little different in fact i tested it out on myself and uh, you can make out the small difference because the screen is uh, you know what we are used to seeing is very different but for somebody who's not used to doing it they they don't realize the difference and uh, our patients who had initially done humphries found it quite easy to use the ava and they actually gave us very positive feedback that they were much more comfortable so also the archiving of the database so frankly you know on the right side you can see this uh, the tab which shows you how the test is progressing it can tell you about the fixation losses if you can actually see the eye of the patient and make sure that uh, you know the patient is able to fixate on your fixation uh, spot and it also also gives you the false negatives just like uh, what a good auto perimeter would give you and the software can be based on the cloud so it works very fast and you can pull out old reports quite easily so i liked all the small little features which come uh, you know with the machine and uh, you can it's very intuitive and easy to use also very accurate because we tested it out on some of our patients you know we did repeat tests we did comparative with our uh, humphries fields and we found that it was pretty predictable and accurate so it was repeatable as well and uh, that was very very important thing and you can actually export the reports through email or you can send them wirelessly to the printer so good things which you know you expect of any good device today and uh, so it was a good change you know we are um, i've been very happy with the um you know zai software and we use the uh, forum to you know look at that but here it becomes so easy because you don't need that networking you don't need all that stuff it works quite well 
and i think they're working on new softwares as well because i was looking for gpa which it currently doesn't support but if you're used to gpa i think they're on the lines to develop that as well so the reports look like that it's pretty good it's very much similar to what a humphrey's printout is so that's why i found it very easy to actually interpret as well and uh, so i was uh, wanting to show you this patient which was uh, done on the lsr this is one of our patients you know the right eye and the left eye and uh, on the and if you'll notice the humphrey's uh, reports i'll go back and show you the other one as well now this is just of course a gray scale and i can't show you all the details of the reports but if you look at them they were very 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 comparable and i found uh, you know using that uh, quite good now uh, the places where i felt that uh, you know it'll uh, really work uh, i'll stop screen sharing and i'll just speak for a few couple of more seconds what we found was that you know i think in the current times and covid times when patients are not happy to actually visit the hospital you can actually send this home so we tested that for a couple of our glaucoma patients who were not able to visit the hospital our assistant was able to go home do a rebound tonometry and did the field test it had been overdue for more than a year that was very easy to do carrying it to a camp carrying it between clinics so all these things works great uh, the only thing which i was really concerned about was again the normative database because you know that's one thing so the good thing is that they've uh, probably done a big uh, sample study with uh, you know creating the normative database as well and uh, i was reassured that you know all the indian database has been used here so i think that should solve it so we are still working on it but the initial thing it's been a very pleasant surprise and i have been quite happy uh, using the ava and i'm sure uh, priya will add a lot to this uh, whatever i could uh, you know share from my first experiences and i think that's all i wanted to say today thank you thank you garav uh, i think it is a great uh, way to do the field especially in the covid era because people don't want to you know do it on a perimeter bowl type of a perimeter and uh, there would be also issues with the sterilization etc which can be taken care of when you have it on your eyes uh, like that at a device uh, priya would you like to uh, comment on this because you've used it uh, yeah i agree totally with uh, what dr gorov has said and uh, even i am been uh, using it in my uh, private practice for quite some time so all these benefits are definitely there with the device and uh, there are many uh, new updates which are coming up in the device which will be put up and which would put it up at par uh, with the uh, uh, humphrey and other standard automated perimeters so i think uh, it's a, it's a very handy very good device and it's quite predictable results and everything so i think it has a great future out there over a period of time it will pick up and more so it is portable so in the it is portable that's the yeah, biggest the, advantage yes uh, areas also you can just take it carry yes. it yes and then yes. you know the things which which we cannot now when we go for camps and i'm sure absolutely a, absolutely and the patient yeah the patient can even wear a mask and you know they can do yeah. the analysis like even it, it gives you that protection you can use your Uh, even the patient and the uh, administrator, they both can wear their own mask and take all precautions uh, regarding the COVID and post-COVID data. So I think that there are many, many much more advantages which this device has as of now. Even the strategies, you know, it allows uh, almost all the same strategies as you get on the full perimeter. So that was another advantage which I felt. And maybe we should ask Dr. Pandey. You sir, can, to, uh, yeah, and you can. you can even email the uh, printed test reports to the patients and to the to their relatives. You know, even they can they can keep their uh charts they can keep it uh, they can all save it on their software uh, and whatever they want to do all of the that so i think that there are many uh, good advantages with this dr pandey sir would you want to comment on it i, I think it, it looks very promising actually because uh, the perimetry as it is is not easy to perform and it uh, you know the conditions for doing perimetry are also very stringent which uh, many patients don't like and uh, they actually find it to to do it difficult so if you have a device like this this that makes the job much easier i think the only thing at this point of time would be is not the technologically doing it is a big problem uh, it should be that i think is already being worked out and sorted out uh, the only issue as of now would be to uh, kind of match it with the humphreys because or any other like standard perimeter humphreys or octopus uh, because that's what we are all used to doing it to be doing it and that is what is considered the gold standard so i think in coming days probably we'll see more comparisons that how it compares with the gold standard parameter uh, that will kind of build up our confidence in using this technology uh, versus uh, you know the standard technology uh, it takes time but i I'm, i think things are moving in the right direction and uh, uh, more of more would be in use and especially in situations you know where humphrey cannot be used at all 
like you can't go to the field with the Humphreys and also the COVID is a special situation. So I, I do see a lot of, uh, you know, use for such devices in the coming coming years, uh, definitely. So it's a, it's a good development, a great development. Thank you, sir. Uh, will, uh, sir, would you like to say something, Dr. Lanis? Okay, we move on to the next talk. The next talk is uh, uh, is going to be on choice of IOL in patients with glaucoma. Again, a very important and a pertinent question uh, by none other than Dr. S. S. Pandav, who heads the glaucoma in uh, the PGI uh, Institute, Chandigarh, at Advanced Eye Center. And we've all <coughs> been, um, seen his publications, his work, which is uh, enormous. And so, sir, we would request you to uh, give your talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Namrata, for the invitation. And uh, I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, so, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, so, okay, great. So, basically, I am talking about the choice of IOL in glaucoma patients. Uh, glaucoma and cataract, they very often they exist together because they're all uh, like diseases of the elderly people. Uh, and if you combine these two, I think that there's a number one cause of visual impairment or blindness all over the world. Uh, however, the glaucoma has uh, blindness is peculiar because this is an irreversible blindness as compared to cataract. So it kind of takes residence uh, for me. So what glaucoma does to vision is basically there's a re reduction in the field of vision restriction. It also reduces the contrast sensitivity. Um, that's kind of a ability to differentiate between the shades of light and dark. And also dark adaptation is going down. So whatever procedure you do, uh, you have to keep these things also in mind. And in glaucoma, we know the central vision is preserved uh, till late. Uh, the, what cataract does is basically reduces the central vision. So it presents early, whereas glaucoma presents late. Uh, it also reduces contrast sensitivity because of the changes in the lens. And also there could be a corneal component to that. And uh, the cataract surgery, you know, the success rate of cataract surgery is very high. So expectations are also very high because it improves uh, vision and also the quality of life almost immediately. Uh, but whatever the loss of the contrast sensitivity is there because of uh, neurological reason, the neural reason that will stay, uh, even if you can, uh, you know, improve contrast sensitivity by an, using an IUL, which is, uh, uh, which is which uh, takes care of the corneal or lenticular aberrations, uh, but still some contrast deficit will uh, remain. And if there are already functional defects, uh, they would also remain, uh, which are because of glaucoma. So because the cataract surgery is known to have very good results, so the expectations are high, and uh, you also have to manage the patient's expectations uh, uh, and not only cataract or glaucoma. So that is very important part of counseling. A uh, lot of disappointments actually happens happen because of uh, we haven't explained adequately to the patient. Uh, now coming to the glaucoma implant, how does it impact, IOL, or how the IOL impacts the you know, glaucoma. So as I said, the contrast sensitivity is, you know, is low in these patients. And uh, so you can, you have to keep that in mind where you're selecting the IOL. Uh, visual field testing is again, important issue. And if you improve the quality of the vision, if you improve contrast sensitivity and the vision in general, the, the visual testing becomes good. Uh, and structural imaging also it is influenced by the type of the IOL that we are using. And we have already seen, you know, heard in this, in this session also that IOP lowering happens once you do cataract surgery. So cataract surgery has a lot of uh, good things uh, when you're done in glaucoma, uh, especially when you put in IOL, but there also would be some bad things. Uh, the technical difficulties are that these people uh, in these patients could be small and there could be a zone of weakness and that capsular related problem. So uh, you have to be a good cataract surgeon basically uh, to avoid complication in these uh, patients. So a lot of advances has happened in the IOLs and uh, we have now the spherical uh, or aspheric IOLs, monofocals, multifocals, toric, accommodating. So the question is, which one suit the bill as far as glaucoma patients are concerned? So important thing is to improve the contrast sensitivity. And uh, most of these IOLs now are designed in a way that they reduce the wavefront aberrations. And uh, aspheric designs are actually good now, which can give you a good, uh, uh, you know, vision in mesopic as well as scotopic conditions. So that's kind of that's kind of IOL we would like to have. 
Uh, we also know that the blue filtering IOs, the yellow tinted IOs, they they have better contrast as compared to the normal IOs. And also the toric IOs, by reducing the astigmatism, can improve the quality of the vision and also the patient can see better and the contrast will be uh, better. Uh, many times uh, we'll see multifocal lenses and that actually uh, I see many uh, uh, glaucoma patients, they have multifocal lenses. So I think I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. So multifocal lenses, they reduce contrast sensitivity. So there's a little problem with the multifocal lenses. Uh, not recommended in glaucoma patients, so that would be the general. And extreme caution even in hypertension. So many times the patient may not have glaucoma, but there's the ocular hypertension. Uh, there's a family issue of glaucoma or some other risk factor. So if those things are there, it's better to avoid a multifocal lens because uh, glaucoma is chronic problem. We don't know when the things could take a turn for the worse. So we need to follow them up for a very long time. Also, the multifocal lenses actually affect uh, their, uh, your ability to diagnose glaucoma as well as uh, you know, to monitor the progression. So uh, multifocal lenses, they would reduce contrast, so they will generate depression in the visual fields. Uh, this can be offset to some extent using FPT, but again, FPT is not actually the commonest used parameter. We still depend on uh, white on white parimetry, Goldman, uh, Goldman or Humph Humphreys or Octopus. So, there, uh, the multifocal lenses can produce a little uh, problem in diagnosing glaucoma early. Also, if you look at the imaging, which is kind of a almost uh, universal for OCT uh, is uh, for glaucoma patients, and that can induce uh, artifacts. These multifocal ions can induce artifacts while you're doing OCT. Uh, now the problem is that these artifacts are not kind of his, the same every time or the same location, so they can vary. So even if you change, if you establish a new baseline after a multifocal IOL, you're still not sure whether the changes you are seeing are related to glaucoma or just because of the optical phenomena that's happening uh, because the multifocal IOLs. So in this regard, monofocal IOLs are actually better. So the message is that multifocal IOLs should be avoided. Uh, toric IOs, on the other hand, are good, as I mentioned earlier, by reducing astigmatism, you could provide better contrast uh, and they will help you, uh, you know, see better and also perform better on different uh, investigations as well. However, the one thing to be remembered is that if the patient is likely to need surgery, the access of the toric IOs might change after surgery and that can compound the problem. So the, whatever you gain that will be lost in the post-operative post-glaucoma surgery, especially if you're doing a trabeculectomy or you know, similar procedure, externally training procedure. So use uh, multifocals, uh, uh, toric IO, IOs in glaucoma patient with caution uh, and make sure that uh, only use in patient where well controlled with medicines and uh, surgery is unlikely. Uh, Combined procedures, if you're doing FACO plus trabeculectomy, is probably better not to do it because there are many variables are coming into it and where the access is going to settle post uh, filtering surgery, you don't know. Uh, then there are also issues with the IOL power calculation because uh, now this isn't general for all lenses, that is uh, multifocal or toric or um, normal IOL. Uh, the change in the AC depth as well as excellent happens after glaucoma surgery. Excellent can change after glaucoma surgery. So your IOL power uh, calculation may go, you know, maybe an error uh, happen in that. And uh, where the AC depth is going to be, uh, especially after glaucoma surgery, uh, we don't know. Actually, this could be a, another variable which uh, comes into picture. Uh, this is very true if you're doing a combined surgery. I think many glaucoma surgeons, they like to, and cataract surgeons, they like to combine the cataract surgery or glaucoma surgery. Uh, but however, if you are using the eye well, then we don't know where the, you know, how, where the lens iris diaphragm is settled after uh, filtering surgery and, uh, and cataract surgery. So there's going to be a little, uh, you know, unpredictability here. So uncertainty here. So that has to be known and discussed with the patient. And uh, if you, if you're doing a glaucoma surgery in a pseudo fake eye, even, even in an eye where the eye is already in place, the lens iris diaphragm position could change, the lens position could change, and that could actually uh, induce an error in otherwise uh, with IO power calculation and everything was good. So that also has to be kept in mind. So there are many cautions uh, you have to keep in uh, mind when you're doing cataract surgery, uh, uh, you know, other than the IO power or type of IO. Avoid adrenal in peripheral block, but that could compromise the already compromised circulation. Um, keep the intraocular pressure low, so that keep the FACO parameters low, basically keep IOP low and burn light low and keep 
uh, the parameters on the lower side. Uh, there would could be a high uh, IOP spike within 24 hours or FACO that would be very well known. So if you have a glaucoma patient, make sure that you adequately cover uh, the dietary glaucoma medicine uh, during that period. Uh, to summarize, the cataract surgery is often needed in glaucoma patients and the choice of IO is important. Uh, generally speaking, aspheric monofocal IO is probably the best for these patients. Multifocal IOs are a big no. Uh, from glaucoma point of view. Uh, toric IOLs can be used, but with a little some caution. And uh, keep in mind that there could be refractive uh, surprises due to changes in the lens position or the axial length, and that should be kept in mind. And also protect the optic nerve for, you know, during surgery and afterwards. Uh, with this, I thank you, AIUS, and thank you, Dr. Namrata, for this opportunity to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for clarifying so many myths that we had about which intraocular lenses we should implant and which we should not. What would be your take on the EDOF lenses, the extended depth of focus lenses? Would would you think that they are less forgiving? I mean, they're more forgiving. So I, I think they would be perhaps a little more forgiving, but I think more important thing would be the, the contrast. So any lens which is reducing the contrast sensitivity, I think that would not be good for glaucoma. Uh, because the glaucoma patient inherently they have lower lower uh, contrast and that is because the neuronal reasons basically not because of the optical reasons and that cannot be improved at all. So I think that thing we have to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Lahane, sir, would you want to ask anything? Sir, you, are, you have to unmute. Unmute, sir. Unmute, uh, you, you have uh, explained very well, and uh, there are many always doubts in the mind that uh, what lens we should use in the uh, glaucoma uh, and cataract patient when we are updating. Now, here you have told very categorically that we should not use the multifocal lenses. Yes. But when the vision is less, and when the patients are coming to us, they always ask for the lens which is costly lens or multifocal or trifocal. So they always ask that the premium lens will give the good result. And there is one case in the court is also going on that says that they have not used my premium lens because of that I am blind. Because patient was operated when patient was having 0.9, uh, uh, you can say the uh, cup. And that time he was operated with the aspheric lens and uh, uh, this multifocal was denied. He went in the court of law because he chose the uh, I will wrongly because of that I'm blind. So now, in such situation, uh, what we should answer? Uh, I think uh, the answer is the, the same because, uh, as I said, the the patient expectations are high when, especially when doing cataract surgery. And if you have glaucoma, so you have to manage patient expectations as well before we do surgery. So that counseling ex an explanation of the you know what we are doing is very important and secondly because the why the con the multifocal is not to be used is because it reduces contrast even the best of the multifocals the the contrast would be less than a aspheric monofocal so i think that's very important here and reducing in the contrast means that you are giving a subnormal vision to the coma patient which is, contrast is already compromised and also it will affect his future uh, our future ability to monitor the disease because it would induce some artifacts in the visual fields as well as in imaging. So I think those are the grounds uh, to explain in such situations that um, uh, is uh, aspheric monofocal is is a better deal for these patients. I think uh, sir is very clear about this that you know no multifocals and no IOLs which will decrease the contrast. So I think thank you sir for clarifying that and for you know uh, saying it so dogmatically that we all are, you know, going to follow it because there's always a question and there are anecdotal case reports and isolated uh, cases here and there. But I think, like you said, it is uh, because of the neuronal problem. And so we should not, uh, not for, because of the optical problem. So we should not, we should be using only aspheric monofocal intraocular lenses in these patients. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Priya Narang, and again, Priya Narang is a very good friend, a dynamic surgeon, mm -hmm. a great innovator. She has given so many uh, techniques like blue dial, pinhole pupiloplasty, etc. And she's going to be talking about uh, virtual perimetry ever now and the future. Yeah. 
Uh, is this? Uh, uh, can you see my presentation? It's getting cut from right and left both. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. This is also getting. Uh, you know, actually, this is being played. So okay, okay. it's okay. Okay. Can you see this full screen? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it is full screen from my side. Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Uh, okay. So at the outset, I would like to thank uh, for uh, everyone for having me here, and I'll be just talking upon the uh, newer device which is there on the horizon, the advanced vision analyzer, and I'll be covering up the uh, uh, technicalities of the device and how it stands as of now and for the future. So. Uh, uh, Eva is a virtual reality automated perimeter. I think uh, Dr. Gaurav, he has uh, covered up uh, the basics very well. And we all know that it has uh, four basic components, the head mounted device, the patient response pattern, the test control device, and it has a backend cloud server, uh, which helps to store the patient's data and you can retrieve it as and uh, when you uh, actually need it. So these are just the key features of Eva, which I'm uh, uh, showcasing here. Uh, it is a white-on-white -white perimetry, and uh, uh, AVA has a, a mechanism where, you know, you can correct refractive errors of the patient who is being tested. Uh, you can even adjust the intercubular distance. They have an eye tracking system in the device, and this eye tracking system, uh, it helps uh, uh, a lot to uh, uh, track the movement of the eyes and the uh, pupil uh, the stimuli is usually presented at the standard uh, goldman size 3 and to ensure a reliability test there are patch trials which have been uh, incorporated into the testing strategy and uh, these catch trials are conducted approximately once every 10 stimuli presentation so that you keep on uh, having a check on the false negative positive and the fixation loss uh, as I said before, the cloud-based uh, storage system, it, has, it is a backup of all the tests which is needed, and that is one of the uh, advantages of EVA. Uh, and the data of all the reports, you can easily assess them on the test control device, which is a tablet. Now, that test control device is basically the uh, device from where you can set up the entire um, uh, uh, setup of the patient you can feed up all the parameters this is the head mounted device that you are seeing and this is the test control device uh, you can put up a new report you can start a new test you, you just need to feed up the test strategy that you are going to actually use in this case you can choose the uh, thresholding program you can feed up all the data or you can even take up a fast strategy or a threshold whatever you actually want to do in this case you can just feed up you can even retrieve data by feeding in the patient ID number, and you just get it right up to there. So this is the eye tracking system, which beautifully works for the device. And uh, you are always uh, ensured that you are bang on where you actually want to be. Now, uh, this is the program and the strategy for the device. They have a 30-2, 24-2, 10-2, and a 10-2, which is coming up for the device. And the algorithms are the FAST. The Elizar fast corresponds to what we call as the CETA fast for the Humphrey. It's a screening uh, strategy which is there in the device. Uh, Eliza Zest is the, uh, we call this as an Eliza Zest because it's a zippy estimation of sequential threshold uh, method which has been adopted with a few or changes as compared to the standard Zest method. And this corresponds to the CETA standard which we all are used for doing for Humphrey. And there is a full threshold strategy in the device. So you can go ahead and choose whatever you wish to do for your case. Uh, there is a normative database which has been set up for uh, uh, this device and it has the probability limits which are set uh, for the mean deviation, for the pattern deviation. You have the significance values at 5 to 1 and 0.5% which have been calculated and they have been set into the device. And the database has been collected from uh, quite a varied sources from uh, not very ethnic, but yes, from the local sources, uh, it is there. Uh, the blind spot localization of the device is uh, uh, very uh, accurate. Uh, the uh, fixation accuracy, in fact, is just comparable to Humphrey. Uh, there are many trial methods that we have done as of now. And uh, uh, the test retest variability of the device also meets up to the uh, uh, level where we actually expect it to be. So the test retest variability, the, we all know, the linear regression analysis have been done for this and the eccentricity 
and uh, with the increase in the eccentricity that is as you move from central to peripheral zone there is a corresponding increase in the variability and all these tests are in what i mean to say is they are in sync with what we actually uh, have reported and what we have actually seen uh, which is uh, there with the humphrey device so the test re, uh, the, the the device it uh, the test retest variability of the device sets in very well into this there are the clinical comparative studies which uh, we have done uh, the results are quite comparable for the normals and for the glaucoma group uh, maybe i might not be sharing much more here because it's still in the pure but uh, what i would like to say is and these are the test reports which you can see on the left and on the on the right side uh, it's quite comparable uh, for the ava and for the humphrey the field effects in uh, glaucoma cases and uh, the ongoing development for the device as of now is the uh, progression analysis which which is uh, going on for this device which is being built up and the emr integration into the device so uh, looking up to all these things and the advantages that come up with this device is it is quite portable we all know that is the uh, biggest advantage of this there is no learning curve it's very easy even a technician learns it and they can go ahead and do the procedure and uh, there is uh, quite comparable results for the detection of the visual field effects and it is quite cost effective and uh, it does not occupy any space in your clinic you can do it anywhere where you want to you do not need a dedicated dark room for doing it uh, it's helpful in rural areas because you can do the screening procedure and uh, you can uh, examine all these cases and the advantages you can share those results with the glaucoma expert you can send them and take their advice and you, you can move ahead in the right direction helping your patients even in the periphery or wherever you are working Uh, it gives a lot of postural freedom it's very helpful for the uh, bedridden patients especially patients who have other disabilities who cannot position themselves and it's also useful in the post covid situation because as i told you before you know you can even wear a mask and you can do this so it's very helpful you can keep as much distance as you want the minimum distance the physical distancing what we call between the interpreter and the uh, patient and the examiner so uh, summing up all this i think there are great advantages this is something which we actually look forward to in future and it seems to be promising with the many more clinical trials in the pipeline uh, uh, i think the results as of now uh, are wonderful so thank you so much for this if anybody has any queries i would be glad to answer alternatively you can also email me at my email id thank you so much thank you priya and i'm sure uh, you analyzed the results of this device and compared it also uh, with the standard ones and the results are going to be quite exciting you also sent it for publication so yeah. we await the results of the publication thank you very much and thank now you. it's my pleasure to uh, ask the next speaker dr roni george who's a senior consultant at uh, in glaucoma at shankar netralay to give his talk on risk factors for glaucoma what should you look for thank you dr namrata and dr bhane for the uh, kind invitation and ashwin also so i'm going to talk to you bris briefly about the risk factors for glaucoma what you should look for and what we're trying to do over here is basically when a patient comes to in the clinic what are the things that could indicate that they maybe have glaucoma and i'll be using data from some population based studies to tell you this so one of the reasons why this is important is when we looked at our own population based study we found that 17% of afax and 7% of pseudofax actually had glaucoma with afax it's understandable because afax is associated with high rates of secondary glaucoma but a lot of the pseudofax were actually quite nicely done surgeries so the reason many of them had glaucoma is basically because they were missed at the time of glaucoma at the time of the cataract surgery and they continued to progress because only the cataract was done and nothing had been done for the glaucoma and that's the reason that is important as uh, cataract surgeons for us to do a risk assessment for every patient whom we see the single most common risk factor for primary open angle glaucoma is increasing age and that's something we don't need to do any examinations for we know that directly and if you look at all these different studies which i have listed here in each of the studies as you get older once you're in the 70 to 79 age group your risk is 5 to 6 times that in the other groups so if you look at uh, the chennai glaucoma study just as an example 
if you are 70 plus, one in nine people or one in 10 people actually have primary open end glaucoma. So if you see somebody in that age group, your index of suspicion has to be very high. Some of the other studies found male gender and myopia, the urban study found both male gender and myopia to be risk factors for POG and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, if you're just looking not for primary open angle glaucoma, but for any glaucoma, for every year increase in age from the age of 40, your risk of developing glaucoma goes up by 7%. So that means somebody who is, let's say, 80 years old has an almost 280% higher risk of developing glaucoma than somebody who's 40 years old. So your older patients who come to you with a cataract need to be looked at very, very closely. We all know that high intraocular pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma, and that is absolutely true. If your IOP is more than 22, you are 18 times more likely to have glaucoma than if your IOP is less than 22. But unfortunately, a single intraocular pressure reading does not mean anything. And when you look at a single intraocular pressure reading, it is detects glaucoma less than 50% of the time. So you miss the majority of glaucoma, you miss almost 70% of glaucomas based only on IOP alone. And what do you need to do more than IOP alone is basically to look at the optic disc. And for almost any size optic disc, you would see slightly higher optic disc uh, vertical computers ratios, but in almost very few, per, uh, in just two and a half percent of normals, would anybody have a cup to disc ratio of more than 0.7 is to 1. So even if you just take a look at the disc and make sure that cup to disc ratio is less than this, you will actually detect most of the people with glaucoma. What about primary angle closure suspects? If you have, if you have a narrow angle, you have almost a three and a half times greater risk of having glaucoma. And in all studies, when you look at angle closure disease, increasing age continues to be a risk factor. The other interesting factor are biometric factors. And this is something all of us as cataract surgeons do look at. And if you compare the shortest eyes versus the longest eyes, you can see that in the shortest 10% of eyes, 70% plus of patients will have some form of angle closure disease. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen in the longest eyes. Even in the longest eyes, 10% of patients could have angle closure disease. But if you see somebody with a very short eye, take another look, it's very likely that they have some form of angle closure glaucoma. When you look at anterior chamber depth, the shortest 10%, which is around 1.5 millimeters or less, 90% of them have some form of angle closure disease. So biometry is a very good indicator for angle closure disease and you should keep an eye on it. What can you do if you have a busy clinic and you cannot do a gonoscopy on everyone? At least do a von Herrick test. If the von Herrick test is negative, you're fairly sure that angle is open. But if it is positive, you have to do gonoscopy on all of them. So in terms of angle closure glaucoma, angle closure disease, if you see a shallow von Herrick, please do gonoscopy because 8% of those people above the age of 40 years could have narrow angles. Other ocular risk factors include pseudoexfoliation, which is associated with a three times higher risk of glaucoma. And when you look at pseudoexfoliation patients in studies done from India, if you have pseudoexfoliation, you may have anywhere between three to 9% of them having glaucoma. So the presence of pseudoexfoliation not only makes cataract surgery a little challenging, but it, in, it's a indicator that they may be having glaucoma. We already spoke about pseudofakia and fakia, and they increase the risk of glaucoma by two to four times. What about progression? When you, we see all these patients repeatedly, so what are the factors that we need to look for to see which patients are at risk of actually, con, I mean, which glaucoma suspects are at risk of progressing? When we looked at the risk factors for incident POG, that is people who are otherwise not previously normal who develop POG in future, we found that in general, they tend to, to have higher intraocular pressure, lower central corneal thicknesses, or more likely to have longer axial length and a higher cup to disc ratio. A combination of a low central corneal thickness and an IOP of more than 19 was associated with uh, almost 11 times greater risk of having glaucoma. Similarly, a, a CCT of less than 500 and a vertical cup to disc ratio of um, more than 0.5 was also associated with increased risk of lifetime risk of POAG. When you look at primary angle closure disease, Higher IOP was one of the risk factors, but hyperopia was another risk factor. If you are hyperopic, you are more likely to develop angle closure disease in your lifetime. And then we looked at biometric parameters. If your axial length was less than 21 millimeters of mercury, one in five people would develop angle closure disease within five years. If your AC depth was less than 2.5 millimeters, 15% or one in six would develop angle closure disease over a five-year period. And lens thickness was not as good, but still had a 10% risk. When you project all this to India, you find that almost 40 million people 
have either glaucoma or risk factors for glaucoma. And this was, you know, brought back to us when we looked at our own data and look at the prevalence of glaucoma in patients referred for cataract surgery from rural screening camps. All of these patients undergo a complete examination when they come to us. And in this cohort of about 1,200 patients whom we saw over randomly selected over a one-year period, we found that 7.2% had some form of glaucoma. 4.5% POAG, 2.4% primary angle closure glaucoma, and a few secondary glaucomas. So it's actually, if you're in a cataract practice, what this means to you is that when a patient who's above 40 years comes to you, you have to have a high index of suspicion. If they're older, and even high index of suspicion, because one in nine is likely to be a glaucoma suspect or have glaucoma. Keep in mind that disc IOP alone is inadequate and a good disc evaluation is really important. One other is a must. And when you look at the biometry, if you have extremes, the shorter eyes or the longer eyes, don't forget that you could be missing uh, an, uh, an underlying primary open angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma. Thank you once again. And it's, it's been a pleasure to participate. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ronnie George, and uh, again for a very useful talk. Uh, sir, would you or any of the panelists would like to, you know, comment or say something? Uh, I think the Ronnie uh, has covered near about all the um, these uh, features which will give rise the glaucoma and what should be examined uh, in that. I think the. Uh, any panelist, I think uh, we can ask the uh, if some discussion is to be there, we can ask the Pandav sir. Pandav sir, my one question to you and Roni and also Priya, uh, Ariga, and uh, everybody that when there is a patient with a 0.9 CDR and uh, other eye is blind, patient is having the cataract and patient is having the glaucoma. Now, what is with the line of treatment? Uh, when such type of patient comes to you because that patient will come to you after going to three four five six doctors and then patient has come to you because your name the people has referred so now i will ask pando sir uh, sir please advise what is to be done uh, i think uh, since uh, this is a one eyed patient and uh, you said about 0.9 cup uh, 0.9 CD ratio is kind of a is interpreted in view of the disc size, but assuming that is truly a 0.9, uh, so that means we are actually dealing with a very advanced disease, and uh, I am assuming the visual field defects would be there in this patient. Uh, the important thing will also be to look at the the is IOP. Uh, he has cataract, of course, and the level of visual equity and IOP. These two things would be important to consider here, and also the history of the patient, how the disease has progressed in the past. Other eye is blind, uh, you know, I'm assuming it has is because of glaucoma. So it really becomes a high risk for, uh, you know, the blind, the risk of blindness. Ultimately, we, what we are looking at is the risk of blindness in this uh, particular patients. So it seems to be that there's a significant risk of blindness in this patient. So, uh, so in that context, we need to intervene. Uh, the question would be what intervention could be done for him? Uh, now that would also depend on the IOP and how it's controlled with medicines and whether the other eye was lost because of the lack of medicines or lack of therapy or lack of compliance. So those issues need to be addressed for the other eye. And uh, that's how we take a decision. Now, if the IOP is well controlled with medicines, I would like to keep it you know, controlled with medicines uh, and uh, deal with the cataract surgery. Because I, I uh, generally, I prefer not to do a combined surgery. And if I have to do a surgery for a glaucoma patient, uh, if glaucoma is a priority, like in this patient, then my preference, uh, first preference is going to be a glaucoma, deal with glaucoma medically or surgically uh, before re removing the cataract. But his cataract is advanced and because one eyed and he's, that's interfering with the quality of his vision, then definitely we could uh, do a cataract surgery, with glaucoma surgery or before that. Now, when I do before that is if it's a case of angle closure disease, uh, in spite of, uh, you know, advanced glaucoma, sometimes I prefer to do cataract surgery first in angle closure, particularly. Uh, if it's an open angle, then I probably combine the surgery. But if it's an angle closure disease, then uh, I would be inclined towards doing cataract surgery first, uh, taking care of preserve his vision in the perioperative period. 
and then see because I have seen that many a times, uh, even in uh, chronic ankle closure, doing cataract surgery actually leads to a significant reduction in IOP, uh, which is more than uh, you know the, what we see in the POAG. And the other issue in these patients also is the fluctuations because angle closure glaucoma patients they tend to IOP tend to fluctuate a lot when the angle is getting included. Uh, so uh, that is also taken care of if you are removing the cataract first and doing glaucoma surgery later. So my, in general, my preference would be, is my approach is in angle closure, I prefer to do cataract surgery first if both are coexisting. And in open angle glaucoma, I tend to do glaucoma surgery first. But if the situation like this is a warrant, then I would do a combined surgery also. So Thank combined you. surgery for me is a third choice. Thank you, Pandav, sir. I will ask Rodi. Uh, Dr. Roni, the, uh, my another question to you is the when patient is having all types of, all, we, we start three drugs. After the starting three drugs, now the patient's intraocular pressure is more than 30. Yes, sir. This patient, uh, today I have seen the patient, other eye is blind, one-eyed patient, the intraocular pressure is the 30. And uh, uh, the this uh, even you can see it is a very uh, point eight point nine cup very se severe disease in that eye. So now how to control this pressure? When we have started, we have given diamox also from three days they are giving diamox. After the diamox also the pressure is coming. They were saving me because my student they treated. The pressure is uh, was fifty five and then now it is a thirty. Now, how to go ahead? If I will operate, then uh, what will happen? And if not, what will happen? So what is your opinion in such situation? Yes, sir. so um, it's a challenging case, sir. And uh, one of the issues here is to try and find out what type of glaucoma it is. Because sometimes these acute presentations of 55 can be a closed angle or it can be some form of a secondary glaucoma where the pressure goes up acutely. It can also be steroid abuse because that is the other thing which patient is using a skin ointment somewhere liberally. They can also sometimes present like this with very, very high pressures. And if we can identify a secondary cause and take care of that, we can sometimes control things better. The problem here is we have started all the medications in the past three to four days. And most of our eye drops will take at least a week to two weeks or longer to start getting their peak actions. So if we can somehow control the pressure for that long, with oral medications, maybe add on oral glycerol temporarily, and we see a downward trend over the next few days, we may be able to hang on till that time and see whether medications can actually help you. But on the other hand, if the pressure stay at this level, 35, 40 on everything, then we have no option but to think in terms of surgery, explaining the due risks of surgery, uh, such as a supracoroidal and, and everything else. Because a pressure of 45 to 50 is not going to do any benefit to the nerve if you leave it like that over the next three to four weeks. Now, what, uh, what is the choice of surgery? What surgery you will advise? I would uh, advise a trabeculectomy first sir, because uh, it is your, your first aim here is to control the IOP. Even if there is a coexisting cataract, get the pressures under control with the minimum possible manipulation and address the surgery as a cataract as a second um, um, setting. Thank you. I think uh, we had an excellent discussion uh, and uh, thank you Ashwin and Agrawal Eye Hospital. Thank you Priya, thank you uh, Murli, thank you uh, Pandav sir, thank you Roni uh, and uh, thank you everybody. Ashwin, towards you. Thank you. Uh, thank you each and every one of you. Honestly, it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure watching this webinar. It's so much of learning and depth uh, to this field and actually combining the two because a lot of times we are combated with both cataract and glaucoma all is together you know in that same space so we are all uh, instead of competing we need to partner and that's the whole purpose of you know this whole journey of uh, cataract with glaucoma so thank you so much everybody and attendees for watching uh, god bless and happy holidays coming for uh, christmas and new years uh, and each one of you also, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Namarata, for conducting thank an you, excellent. Uh, thank you, Alashwin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It was a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.